Thank you for coming. We have what I think is going to be a very exciting program today. About two and a half years ago, okay, we had the first detection of gravitational waves. There was the collision of two blobs or nothing, okay, just pure curvature, and you will learn more about that in a second. Today you will hear about a second event that is equally excited, it's not more, and we'll be listening to the description, the implications from that event from Laura Caronati, Napa Mukote, and Nasio Tabuada. They are three of our stars in the School of Physics, and their research has taken them to meet very important people, Caronati with the King of Spain. By the way, the King of Spain is the one in the right, not the one on the left. <laughs> and uh, he has taken Professor Tabuada to remote regions on the Earth. He is here in the South Pole. And from the point of view of Professor Tawada, Professor Ote is also in a very remote place. It's just across uh, Tech Square here in Georgia Tech. <laughs> All right, without further introduction, uh, uh, I would like to first introduce Laura Calonati. She will tell us first an in general introduction to the topic that will be presented today. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna take that, if you don't mind, the pointer, thank you. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm very excited to tell you tonight about uh, one of our most recent discoveries. Um, so it's, uh, as the title of this event is, we're gonna be talking about the multi-sensory experience of the universe. So I'm gonna start by introducing the discovery, and then uh, my colleagues will tell you about uh, some of the things we learned. So I'll add some little bit myself, and then we'll have time for questions. All right, so let's start with the view of the universe. This is one of the most accurate images we have of the universe. It's a deep field image uh, from the Hubble telescope. And it's showing uh, what we can see electromagnetically uh, about the universe. So we see uh, structures, we see galaxies. We've learned a lot from electromagnetic waves. This is instead how uh, Einstein sees the universe, Hansel saw the universe. So this is a two-dimensional uh, cartoonish representation of uh, space-time. According to the theory of general relativity, uh, space and time are not flat, but they are curved. So the effects of a heavy object like a black hole is to curve space. And so the motion of planets around uh, stars or stars within galaxies or galaxies around each other are all driven by being moving in a curve space-time. Now, uh, according to general relativity still, whenever large uh, collisions happen out in the universe, uh, important events that change the gravitational fields, that space-time starts rippling away. Just like when you take a rock, you throw it in a pond, it creates ripples. Those ripples take away energy from the event itself. Same thing happens to space. So Einstein predicted these ripples that are called gravitational wave in 1916, so 100 years before we announced the discovery. And, uh, and that's what they are. They are ripples in the fabric of space-time that are telling us about events that happened far, far away in the universe a long, long time ago. Sounds like the entrance to Star Wars, right? Um, and, uh, and tell us what happened there in a way that we couldn't learn from electromagnetic radiation. So, uh, for instance, if we get uh, two black holes or two neutral stars that are rotating around each other, they change the gravitational field, and this is what the space does uh, in the neighborhoods. And so these are the waves propagating, and if you uh, look in this grid at two, uh, each two points, as the gravitational wave goes by, they get closer and farther away, and that's the effect of a gravitational wave. That's what we want to measure. So changes in the metric of space-time. So uh, I am part of the LIGO uh, collaboration, the LIGO project. So LIGO uses interferometry to measure tiny, tiny changes in uh, length uh, that are due to the passage of gravitational waves. So this is an aerial picture of the LIGO detector in Enford, Washington. Uh, these are four kilometer arms. And the way, uh, what we're trying to do is to measure relative changes in the length of these two arms due to the passage of a gravitational wave. 
And we do this by using a laser interferometry. So we have a laser beam, we split it at the mirror, get it to travel back and forth along the two arms. As the gravitational wave goes by, the distance between the mirrors uh, changes in a different way. And so uh, we exploit changes in the interference pattern between the two laser beams that are combined to measure changes in the length of the two arms. So this is a sketch of how LIGO works. When there is no gravitational wave, the two beams cancel each other. As the gravitational wave goes by, the interference pattern you will see here changes. And so a little bit of light comes through. And so that's what we monitor to test the passage of a gravitational wave. So these little flickers of light that are coming through. These are very, very small effects. We are going after changes in length that are 1,000th the size of a proton, of the nucleus of a nitrogen atom, so really tiny. Um, this effect was considered by Einstein unmeasurable. When he first calculated how big a gravitational wave can be, he kind of gave up on the possibility this could ever be measured. As Pablo said earlier, uh, two years ago, exactly uh, two days ago is the two-year anniversary, um, we discovered gravitational waves that were produced when 1.3 billion years ago, two black holes that were 40 times the mass of the sun collided. They produced an enormous amount of energy, 50 times the luminosity of the visible universe, and the gravitational wave traveled to us at Rich LIGO on September 14, 2015. So we talked about this a couple of years ago. Um, um, it was an exciting moment because for the first time we could hear the sounds of the universe. We can take the signal from LIGO, plug it in a speaker and listen to it. And so we can hear the sound like this, that 1.3 billion years ago, these two black holes produced. So this is a very powerful new way to probe the universe. So this is an increased pitch. This is the final Yelp of two black holes that collided 1.3 billion years ago. Okay, so this, this is, this is a new, a new, our new sense that we have added in our experience of the universe. Now, um, that was with black holes. Now, the new thing is that we have now discovered the collision of two neutron stars. Uh, Nepomuk is going to tell you more about what neutron stars are about. Uh, the only thing I'm going to tell you is that the neutron star is uh, characteristic by having matter involved in the process. So it's not two blobs of nothing. There is lots of matter. And when there is matter, you also have production of radiation. So we have gravitational waves, but also visible infrared light, radio waves, gamma rays, and possibly there could be neutrinos as well. So for the first time, we have all these different messengers that can come, we can bring together to understand the source much better. And so this is the equivalent of turning on the audio on what was the silent movie of the universe. So what you see here is a, is a, a no sound, it's a mute movie of, uh, of the jungle. So you see a lot of the things that are going on in there. If you turn on the sound to your movie, then you hear there are more things. You find out there are actually animals hidden in there. There are birds. There, are, uh, there is a, a huge amount of power here that's producing that waterfall. You can infer all of this from what you hear, and sometimes you get surprises, like this one. Here it comes. Right? So, so this is what we're doing in a way. We have our new sounds on our movie of the universe, and that's what we're going to use to learn all the things that we're going to be telling you about. So uh, here's our event. Uh, this is what our data look like. On August 17, 2017, uh, the two LIGO detectors and our Virgo detector, our, our partner Virgo, were acquiring data, and this is what our, the noise normally looks like. But um, over the course of about a minute, we could see a signal building up, this little trace. This is the chirp. Let's make carefully. It was very hard to hear. You're going to hear a much cleaner uh, type of uh, uh, sound without the noise later. But this trace here, this is what we were expecting to see from the collision of two neutron stars. It's a much longer signal than what we have for the black holes. It lasts 
minutes and not just fraction of a second. And the details of this waveform tell us about the details of what happens at the two neutron stars merge. And so uh, we measure this event in gravitational waves in the LIGO M4, the LIGO Livingston. These are the two LIGO detectors. This is the Italian detector Virgo. And then we gave the information to all sorts of observatories, uh, electromagnetic observatory all around the world. And we have all this plethora of information that is coming from multi-wavelength observation of electromagnetic waves and the gravitational waves. And so now we can tell a story of a collision that took place 135 million years ago in the Hydra constellation in the southern hemisphere, just about the time dinosaurs were roaming Earth. And we have the story of these two neutron stars that merge, produce gravitational wave, produce jets of light, produced ex radioactive explosion, radioactive reaction in the surrounding. And uh, we could measure the af afterglow of it. And so uh, my colleagues are now going to start telling you about some of the things we learned, bringing all of this information together in telling the full story of this binary to star merger. So next, we're going to hear from Nepal Mokarte about cosmic alchemy. All right, so um, I will say a few words about what we have learned about this neutron star neutron star merger, about the um, production of heavy elements. And uh, heavy elements in this regard means anything that's heavier than iron because we think that iron uh, is produced uh, mostly in uh, some uh, supernova remnants or exploding stars, which is very different to what, uh, what this year is. Okay, but before I go down into the nitty gritty, I would like to say a few words about what a neutron star actually is, uh, because it's uh, quite an extraordinary um, object that, is, uh, that you find plentiful in, in, in space. So these are uh, objects that you are hopefully all familiar with. Uh, this is the sun. And in astronomy, we use the sun as a unit mass. Uh, so we specify masses in terms of solar masses. You say one, so one solar mass means uh, the mass of, of the sun. So neutron stars have uh, masses that range between 1.5 and 2 solar masses. Okay? But the size of a neutron star is very, very different to that of our sun. Down here, this little blob here, this is Earth in comparison to the sun. A neutron star is actually much, much smaller than Earth. This here shows a picture uh, having the neutron star in scale to uh, Manhattan, which is here. So it's a very compact object, just 15 miles in diameter. But there's something very fundamentally wrong with this picture, and I would like to point that out. If you bring a neutron star that close to Earth, what's going to happen is that the Earth gets sucked onto the neutron stars immediately. Remember, this is two solar masses, and the gravitational force exerted by the neutron star onto Earth and everything that's on it are tremendous. So what's going to happen uh, with you getting sucked onto neutron stars, you disintegrate into your nuclear components, right? Into your nuclei, protons, neutrons, and you will live on a very thin crust on this neutron star, which consists of heavy nuclei, uh, electrons, uh, neutrons, and so on. If you would be able to dip deeper into the neutron star, it would get even weirder, and you would only see neutrons, and depending on how the equation of state is of matter under these very extreme conditions, we don't have a a very good idea on how, how, this equation, how the equation of state looks like. Um, it might even be that neutrons even can't withstand the, the extreme uh, conditions inside that star and uh, uh, disintegrate into their uh, co um, uh, constituents, which are quarks and gluons. All right, so so much about an introduction into what neutron star is, is and let's go back uh, to the actual merger that was seen by LIGO, the merger of two neutron stars. So this is a very violent process uh, as the two neutron stars, which again, remember, this is just 15 miles in diameter. We're, we're talking a very compact small region where you have now four, uh, about three to four solar masses uh, uh, spiraling into each other. So as this process uh, uh, takes place, you have mass ripping off one neutron star and the other, and uh, which gets then e ejected uh, into the immediate vicinity of the two objects. Okay, this is a very uh, quick process, happens within a fraction of a second. And after it's all over, you end up with a black hole in the center and a very small fraction. We're talking about point, uh, about 5% solar masses or so 0.05 solar masses in a torus living around that black hole. Now, this is a very extreme environment too. Um, this is very dense, first of all. Uh, if you would uh, take a, a milk jug and fill it with a matter that's surrounding that black hole, 
it would have the mass of it would have it would weigh about um, 10 billion 10 million 10 million pounds so it's a very heavy milk truck that you have that's a very dense matter not only that it's rotating very quickly we believe this uh, the matter rotates around that black hole with the velocity of 20% uh, the, the speed of light okay and the third ingredient that you need in order to produce heavy elements we also find here is that it's very very uh, hot we're talking temperatures of billions of degrees it doesn't matter what you whether you use Kelvin centigrade or Fahrenheit right? <laughs> it's very very hot you don't want to put your toes in there but thinking of alchemy this is exactly what you need right you need a big pot that's um, that's bubbling and it's very hot if you want to produce uh, matter uh, heavy elements and that's what's what's uh, happening here in the process that we physicists call rapid neutron capture so what is that so imagine you're an iron atom or iron nuclei I should say uh, that is sitting in this torus and it's it gets bombarded with hundreds of neutrons per second so some of those neutrons actually make it into this nuclei and the nucleus grows okay so it has more neutrons than usual and some of those neutrons decay into protons remember that elements that uh, the characteristics of an element uh, go by the number of protons that you have in it right so you change the element you go from iron to something heavier okay and uh, this is the process that was long believed to take place uh, in neutron star neutron star branches okay and now for the very first time we actually have experimental evidence that that is what's taking place and I will now talk you through the um, um, uh, the, uh, the piece of evidence that we have that that actually takes place all right so the gravitational wave observation by LIGO uh, there's this chirp that Laura showed, uh, showed uh, in the previous presentation tells us two things the mere detection gives us a good idea on how often these mergers take place which is very important if you want to understand how important these neutron star neutron star mergers are in producing the um, heavy elements that we see all around us okay the second ingredient that uh, we get from the gravitational wave observation is the characteristics of this binary system we uh, get the masses of the neutron stars we get the velocities their spins um, all these are very crucial information that you need to uh, feed into an actual simulation that simulates in a computer with millions of CPU hours the, uh, the ripping apart of the neutron stars the heating of the corona around the black hole the, uh, nuclear, uh, the rapid um, nuclear capture process the production of heavy elements and then the outflow of the, of the mass going away from, from the neutron star okay and as it turns out if you walk through that process that uh, not only does uh, you have not only have you significant production of heavy elements in this process okay it also turns out that most likely neutron star neutron star mergers are the dominant process in the universe to produce heavy elements all right now as we all have a little bit of heavy elements in us all that went through binary neutron star mergers which is uh, pretty fascinating all right um, but as an experimentalist, if, uh, if someone comes to me and tells me, yeah, if we do our model simulations, this is what we get out, you don't believe it. All right? You want experimental evidence uh, that that's actually what's taking place. How do you do that? Now, you have to remember that this is a very violent and hot soup here. And everything that's hot and a lot of mass produces radiation, electromagnetic ra radiation that you can pick up with a telescope, for instance, on Earth. And that's actually what has happened. So LIGO sends out alert very quickly, uh, very fast, almost immediately after they see an event. And a lot of telescopes turn their uh, instruments onto the, opt onto the region where LIGO says, that's where we see something coming from. <coughs> okay? And this shows you two pictures taken with uh, the same telescope, or actually I think different telescopes, but the same object. So this is the host galaxy where the neutron star neutron star merger happened. And this little blob here, this is emission coming from the neutron star merger. And this is this is a very this is a very far distance away from 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 Earth. So that that, that there's enough light produced in that process that reaches down to Earth is also another fascinating fun fact. Okay, so what do you learn from these two images here? And there have been plenty of more images taken over over a long long period of time. You see that the blob here is brighter than it is here, and this one here is more bluish, and this one is more reddish. Okay, you can take a more detailed look at this, and this is what's shown here. This shows the um, spectrum, that's what we call it, the intensity coming from this blob in the universe as a function of wavelengths. So this 400 nanometers, 500 nanometers, this is where the sun mostly radiates power, coming, uh, power from. 
Okay, uh, this shows it 1.4 days after the, uh, uh, the merger happened, and this shows it 2.4 days after the merger happened. And you see, this, the spectra look very, very different from one day to the other, okay? And this is exactly what modelers can predict, okay? So they can predict what spectra um, should you see with a telescope if you point your instrument there, okay? And what the modelers actually do is they take this observation and they tune their models until they get a match to the observational data, okay? And from the tuned parameters, they can infer information about what the system is. And it's all conclusive, okay? All the, in, all the measurements that have been done so far, and there are plenty of papers out there, all say, tell the same story. That binary neutron stars are most likely the dominant uh, production regions in the universe where heavy elements get, uh, get made, okay? So I could stop here, but this is a pretty boring one. I will take one piece out of this modeling process, which is this production of the heavy elements, and showing a little movie over time how the elements are produced. And this one is shown on this slide here. Uh, before, uh, before I show the movie, let me explain what, what is shown here. Um, this here shows the, um, in, uh, the abundance of elements, meaning the fraction of elements. The redder, the more abundant, and the bluish, the less abundant. And you only see this blob down here because this shows at the very start of the simulation the matter that we have in the torus around the uh, black hole. Okay, so we have to understand the x-axis too, the y, uh, the y and x-axis. The y-axis here shows the number of protons that you have in a nucleus. Iron has 27, I believe. Uh, so iron uh, nuclei are somewhere up here, and all these here are lighter elements. And this here gives you the number of neutrons that you have um, in a nucleus. Okay. So what I'm showing you now is how this changes as time evolves and what's happening in this cloud around the black hole. Uh, one uh, thing that you should pay attention to, which, which I point out, up here is time. It goes very, very slowly at, at first, and then it goes up uh, faster. This is the temperature that you have in the torus. And here you see the gigakelvin, which means billions of degrees. And this is the density. This is four, uh, four times 10 to seven grams per cubic uh, centimeter. This is, four, uh, this is four times 10 to seven, which is 40 million times heavier than milk. Denser, denser, 40 million times denser than milk. All right, now let's see how this, and this is density in the cloud surrounding the black hole. So now let's see how this changes um, when I start the simulation here. All right, you see this blob going up, and then it's stuck here, and this is because you have a lot of light also around, that's a competing process of neutron capture. You create a heavy nucleus, and as a photon coming breaks up the nucleus, again going to a smaller one. But as the cloud cools down, and was, this is now 2 gigakelvin, uh, photo disintegration is not a dominant process anymore, and neut uh, fast neutral capture takes over until you are at very small, uh, low temperatures, and the material is so dense that neutron capture is not a dominant process anymore. And then these neutron heavy nuclei decay with beta decay onto this valley here, which is called the valley of stability. And this is then what we see in abundances arriving in our, or being around us in our solar system. All right, so this is a simulation that was done by a postdoc in, uh, in Colombia, who I uh, sent an email two days ago. Uh, and he has taken in this simulation all the input parameters that, the, that LIGO provided uh, and the uh, inf information that we get from the optical observations. All right, so this is the end of my talk. There's only one thing I would like to uh, uh, you take away at, at home. Don't try this at home. <laughs> All right, so now that I figured out where my necklace is coming from, um, I want to tell you about some other things that we learned from this binary merge. Um, so from the collision of the two neutron stars and from knowing where this object was located, uh, we have gained a new way to measure not only the scale but also the rate of expansion of the universe. So that's the one thing I want to tell you about now. So um, what we know now is that the universe is expanding and the speed of expansion of the universe increases the faster, the farther away uh, the universe is. So the Hubble constant is uh, this uh, scale for the rate of expansion of the universe. Uh, that's, that's what we want to measure. That's what's going to tell us. Uh, it's the ratio between the distance and the velocity, and that's what's going to tell us how fast the universe is expanding. 
Now, there is a problem, however, in uh, measuring this parameter uh, using what's called the cosmic distance ladder. So, um, to estimate this parameter, we can use information from the nearby universe by uh, using these uh, uh, variable stars called the Cephids or uh, type 1 supernovae, which are known as standard candle, and uh, looking at how uh, the redshift of the light changes as a function of the distance, we can extrapolate in calculating uh, the Hubble constant. Other measurements have been done that instead start from the cosmic microwave backgrounds and uh, from the outside, from measurements in the faraway universe, try to infer uh, what's happening to the rate of expansion of the universe. And that comes out with a number that's not consistent with what we learned from the nearby universe. So there is an ongoing uh, quandrum in uh, cosmology in how do we really measure the size of the universe. And gravitational waves are giving us a new uh, way to do that. But before I tell you about that, um, I want to talk a little bit about how we figured out where this object is, where it took place. So what you see here is, is what we call a sky map. Uh, and this sky map is, is basically giving us the location of the objects uh, out in the universe. Uh, we have not talked about gamma ray burst yet, and Josh is going to tell us about it. Uh, but um, in coincidence with this event, we also had a gamma ray burst, one of that flash that you saw in the animation. From using information of the, of the GRBs, the gamma ray burst, we could identify, localize the source of these objects to within uh, a region that corresponds to roughly 6,000 full moons, which is huge. Okay? Uh, the information from LIGO and Virgo combined pointed, I'm not going to tell about this other region, but this, this region here is where we could localize uh, the source by using triangulation. So we had two detectors that saw the signal. Virgo, the detector in, in, uh, in Italy, did not see the signal. So we knew that uh, we were in a blind spot for the Italian detector. And from that, using triangulation, which works pretty much like the GPS on your phone is telling you where Starbucks is. It's the same concept, uh, except reversed. And so that's allowed to narrow down to about 150 full moons. So that's the size that if you take your, 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 your hand and you point it out at arm's length, that's pretty much how much of, of, uh, of an arc uh, is covered by this region. And this is something that uh, the telescopes could point to try and identify the optical counterparts. And so um, I'm going to now show you an animation of how we could uh, narrow down. So rapidly we could identify there were about 50 galaxies in that region that the source could come from. And then uh, uh, all these telescopes that were scanning that region, within 10 hours, uh, could identify a little blip of light that was uh, uh, on the edge of the Hydra constellation and that was not there the day before. And so this is this little blip. This is a picture, a snapshot in optical uh, of, of that galaxy. So we could really see the object. So we heard it and then we saw it, okay, the multisensory. So now knowing when the galaxy is, we can measure the redshift. And so the redshift is what tells us the velocity at which uh, the object is moving. And so now, um, uh, now we have a new tool uh, to measure uh, the size of the universe. So this is the Hubble formula I was telling about. The velocity of expansion is proportional to the distance via the Hubble constant. Uh, this is uh, the measurement of the Hubble constant uh, that has come from measurements in the nearby universe. This light green is the value that's measured from cosmic microwave backgrounds, inferences from the faraway universe. These two numbers differ by 8%, which is huge in cosmological scale. Um, the binary neutron star, we could see what the object is, so we can measure the redshift of the galaxy by uh, optical observations. And so that tells us how fast it's moving and the measure of this V sub H. Um, and then we, are, we have, from the gravitational wave, a scale that tells us how far this object really is. Because the gravitational wave that we get is inversely proportional to the distance, and we can calculate exactly how much energy is produced at the source. And so that gives us a measurement for D. So from just one event, we actually don't have a very accurate measurement, right? So this is the probability distribution for H, 
for that particular event, very broad. However, this is from one measurement. We are now expecting to see many more of these objects. LIGO is not at its full sensitivity. LIGO will be sensitive to twice as far out, so 10 times more sources. In coming years, uh, with the upgrade that we're expecting to these detectors, that number is going to be going up by orders of magnitude. And once you get lots of this, lots of uh, values estimates for H0, then this distribution is going to narrow down. So now we have started a new field of gravitational wave cosmology, where the gravitational wave, combined with identifying the source, is going to tell us measurement, is going to put add values to this distribution for H0, and tell us how fast the universe is expanding. So that will be all other talk that's going to come in a few years, I think. All right, so next we're going to hear about gamma ray bursts. So this is a, a very interesting uh, serendipitous discovery that was done by actually monitoring for testing of nuclear weapons on the surface of the Earth. There's a... Okay, I got it now. So this was a discovery made uh, for um, accidentally by monitoring uh, for nuclear explosions. And this is a treaty that was signed between the Soviet Union and the United States. And uh, the uh, partial nuclear test uh, ban treaty it was signed in 1963. And within a week of signing, the US had already launched a satellite to, to begin monitoring of this following a nuclear explosion on the surface of the of the planet you get this bright emission in in the, in gamma rays that can be observed uh, from a satellite from a satellite in orbit and uh, there is eventually a flotilla of these of these satellites and in 1967 uh, they found a bright gamma ray burst that they could immediately tell that it was not coming from the surface of the planet and not only that the time profile of how the gamma rays arrived was inconsistent with a nuclear with a nuclear explosion because one of the things this this system could also do was testing of nuclear weapons in a space so right away they knew this was of astrophysical astrophysical origin these things are called gamma ray bursts and uh, people did not have a clue what they were it was eventually published in 1973 when the people working on this system had actually the time to spend uh, doing the publication. And with current satellites, and there are multiple of them that are able to detect gamma ray bursts from, uh, from Earth orbit, uh, about one per day is observed. Now, what are they? What are they? And um, so one of the first clues about what they are came from the identification of many by the, the, by the BATSI, by the uh, BATSI instrument in the um, Compton uh, Gamma Ray Observatory. That was a gamma ray observatory that flew in the 90s. Uh, it has been now superseded by the Fermi Observatory that is in orbit right now. But if you look at the sky there, it covers the entire sky, and you see that the location of gamma ray bursts, there are almost 3,000 there observed by Batsy. The location of them is uniform in the sky. In any single direction, we have equal probability of finding a gamma ray burst occurring at a given time. And that tells you that a gamma ray bursts are of extragalactic origin. They don't happen in our own galaxy. So knowing that something happens in our own galaxy is really, really easy. If you step outside in a clear night, not in Atlanta because we have a lot of light pollution, but in the, in the countryside, you look up and you see the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is this line that crosses the sky from one side to the other. You see it especially in summer. And then you have a picture there of you know, now all the sky and how the Milky Way is. The part that you see shining in the Milky Way, well, that's where the stars are. That's where the gas is. Um, so if gamma ray bursts were to happen in <coughs> our own galaxy, we would also expect them to be in the same place as the Milky Way. But well, that's not what we see. So um, that was the first clue. And, um, and, and this, is, this is very interesting, because it implies that whatever is producing these gamma rays is extremely powerful. 
so that we can see it over gigantic distances, gigantic distances at Earth. Um, there are actually two types of gamma ray bursts. Um, there's the short one and the long one, and they're classified similarly by how long they last as observed at Earth. So here's a plot made also with that instrument, BATSI, the same number of, of bursts that you have, you know, um, many hundreds of bursts there. And, and you see that, you know, you have two peaks. You have a short peak and you have a long peak. So I'm, all, I'm only interested only in the short ones. But both of them are known to be located isotropically in the universe. Both of them have, have extragalactic origin. One of the, another clue that came from, for the origin of, of short gamma ray bursts was taking a pictures of galaxies where the gamma ray bursts happen. So what we would have is a satellite, for example, the BATSI instrument on the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, or later SWIFT Observatory that is also able to observe gamma ray bursts. And then they tell the best location that they can provide to ground instruments, ground telescopes. And then the telescopes rapidly point in that direction and they try to see the fading afterglow with visible light, the one that we are sensitive to, and try to find that afterglow. Once you find that afterglow, then you say, oh, is there a galaxy that is right next to that point or on top of that point? And then you can measure using the distance data that Laura was discussing. Uh, you can measure the distance to that specific, a specific galaxy. And then you can look at the location of the gamma ray bursts with respect to that galaxy. And this picture that you saw, that you see here, is for a specific uh, short gamma ray burst that happened in, in, uh, in May of 2005. And uh, the circle is the location of where the gamma ray burst happened, the short gamma ray burst happened. And the, the stuff in black is, is, is that specific galaxy. And this is a galaxy that is, you know, three billion light years away, 3.6 billion light, light years away. It's, it's extremely far away. And that again tells you about the extreme power of these uh, gamma ray bursts. And see that the gamma ray burst is not happening right on top of the galaxy. It's a little bit of offset. And actually, every time that they managed to identify one of these galaxies and they had a short gamma ray burst, it never happened on top of the galaxy. It happened always a little bit off. So why does that happen? Why is that that way? And that is because neutron stars are not regular stars. What you're seeing there in the image of the galaxy, the part that is black, is regular stars and gas shining, that's where the stars are. But neutron stars are born in supernova explosions, and when a star explodes, the remains of the star, which is the neutron star, gets kicked in one direction, and it gets, gets kicked hard enough that it can escape the galaxy you know, to be relatively far. So you expect to find the short gamma ray bursts because they are originating from neutron stars, you expect to find them on the outskirts of galaxies more often than regular, than regular stars. So this was the first clue that short gamma ray bursts were the thing that are actually driving short, that, that the neut neutron stars were actually the thing driving um, um, a short gamma ray bursts. Um, there's another thing I wanted to tell you about, that is if you look at all the gamma ray bursts, all the gamma rays that we get from a short gamma ray burst at Earth, and you calculate how much energy that thing should be producing to account for the observation, the most naive calculation results in that you need hundreds of solar masses being converted into gamma rays. And initially we said that um, you know, a solar mass is the unit of, of mass scale in astronomy. And, and courtesy of equal M, e, e, e equal mc squared, all that mass can be converted into energy, into gamma rays. And hundreds of solar masses uh, into gamma rays is a quantity that no astronomer knows how to produce. There's no known mechanism for producing that amount of gamma rays. A solution to that was to add jets. You have an explosion and then you produce gamma rays only along the jet. So it's not that it's producing equal amounts of energy in all directions, but it's only producing energy along a jet. And when you're looking down the jet of the short gamma ray bursts is that you see it. 
So that one a day that I say that satellites observe is actually only a tiny fraction of all these gamma ray bursts that happen in the universe. There are only those that where we happen to be looking down the jet. Now, this is a simulation of short gamma ray burst. You get the two neutron stars, and they spiral around each other, and uh, they radiate gravitational waves. And because they're radiating gravitational waves, they lose mechanical energy, and they get closer and closer and closer to each other. They eventually merge, and after the merger, then you get these torus that so fast you cannot see it here, and you get the jets emitted along the axis of rotation, the rotation of the star. Let me repeat it. And it is in these jets that are along the axis of rotation of the, of the system that you can possibly see see gamma rays. Now, we now know for certain that gamma ray bursts are, short gamma ray bursts are due to the, the, the merger of, of two neutron stars, and that is because of these two instruments. LIGO, you heard already, it's sensitive to gravitational waves. Fermi is one of the satellites I told you about before is, on, is in orbit around Earth right now. It's able to observe all the sky except whatever fraction is blocked by the planet, which is about you know a third of the sky. So at any given time, it's looking at two thirds of the entire sky, and it's looking in gamma ray at two thirds of the of the of the sky. So Fermi didn't need to know there was something interesting there to be found because it's looking almost everywhere all the time. And this is the data from LIGO and from Fermi satellite at the same time. And you're going to see that as after the gravitational wave, you get the signal in gamma rays. That delay is only, I think, one and a half seconds. And it's precisely the sort of delay that you expect for a short gamma ray burst producing initially gravitational waves and then in the jet, when the gamma rays are produced, that you see that bright flash in gamma rays. So, so you know, this is this is a very long story. It has taken it has taken um, several decades to identify to identify the origin of these uh, gamma ray bursts. And and it's it's very interesting that this this is specific one that was observed. Last August was actually a little bit of a little bit off axis. The jet was not pointing right at all. So it was a little bit off. And uh, one of the things you know to bring back the idea of multisensory is what happens if we actually manage to see one straight down the barrel. And because LIGO is going to be more sensitive, I'm going to see more gamma ray bursts in the future. Once in a while, we'll manage to get one that is like head on. And in that case, it may be that along with the gamma rays we're producing neutrinos that we will to detect with the instrument I'm involved in, which is a neutrino telescope that Pablo mentioned uh, that operates at the South Pole. And then with that, I will finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. So we have, we have 10 or 15 minutes for questions, so I'm going to ask our panelists to sit at the front table. And uh, we're going to have the two of us going around the room with the microphone. Thanks. Very interesting. Uh, you said the gamma ray bursts are directional, and we've got to look square on to see them at maximum strength. Are the gravitational waves isotropic, or are they also directional? Well, they are not as directional. Um, so there is, there, is a, um, th there is some sort of directionality, but it's not really a jet. So uh, there is a preferred direction, but it's, it's, it's not at the same level. So 
it's, uh, it's more likely to catch the off axis component in gravitational wave, and we think that that's what happened in this case, because it's a broader, uh, it's, it's more like, you know, like a peanut, you know, think about. Uh, Thanks. And this might be a, a stupid question. Do gamma rays obey the inverse square law, like an electromagnetic radiation? Yes, yes. So if we were, if the stars colliding were, were 10 times closer, we'd see 100 times the signal? Yes. Okay, thanks. You don't want this to happen in your neighborhood. You don't want this to happen in your neighborhood. Yeah, this is probably as close as you want it to be. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about the noise in the LIGO detectors. Is that um, electronic noise, or is it seismic noise, or is it actually from a stochastic distribution of gravitational wave sources? Like, are you sensitive to the gravitational wave background? Yeah, I, I wish it were only the stochastic background or radiation. Um, so, so there are lots of things that you mentioned here. Uh, so we do expect there to be a stochastic background of gravitational waves uh, from all those old mergers and collision of uh, black holes, and neutron stars, and supernovas. So, we are really picturing the universe not being as flat, but kind of wiggling from all these past events. So the, the stochastic background uh, that is out there. But that's a much weaker signal than the sensitivity, the noise of the detector itself. So um, the noise in a detector like LIGO has different components. And depending on the frequency, uh, the source is going to be different. So the seismic noise is uh, dominating at low frequency. Uh, we have noise due to the thermal motion uh, of the atoms in the suspensions or on the surface of the mirror, and that's in the middle frequency range. And then we have uh, um, what's called the shot noise, which is a form of quantum noise that comes from having uh, individual photons hitting the photodiode, and that's what's dominating the high frequency. So the sensitivity of, uh, of, uh, of LIGO is determined by these noise sources. And when we say uh, we want to increase the sensitivity of LIGO, it means that we are targeting these noise sources um, separately. So uh, by improving the suspensions, uh, the material that coats the mirror, and uh, increasing the power that's in the detector itself. Um, and that's, that's the way we are, we're going to lower the sensitivity. Uh, so increase the sensitivity or lower the noise. On the jets that are being emitted, have you been able to determine the divergence angles to determine how many we'd likely to see based on distance? You want to take that? I think that's uh, very uncertain. We're talking about on the scale of maybe five degrees, but it might be smaller. Um, but that is definitely subject of research, not, not conclusive. Uh, this might be a naive question, but uh, I, I know that uh, gravitational waves are supposed to be analogous to uh, electromagnetic waves. Um, is the energy just stored in the frequency of the wave or the amplitude or both? Um, so it's uh, what we measure the amplitudes of the wave. Um, so, so, so yeah, I mean, of course, there's a, you know, we look at it in frequency domain, but it's, it's the amplitudes of the signal that's, 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 storing the energy, if that makes sense. Fascinating talk. I loved it. All of it. Thank you. Um, you mentioned with the um, binary star merger, it's like throwing a, a pebble in a pond and you get a series of uh, ripples. When you, if that happens with a merger and you detected one wave, wouldn't you then expect to find another one and then another one? Right. So, so actually, the, the gravitational wave has been there all along. Now, what changes over time is that uh, the two neutron stars get closer. And as they get closer, they spin faster. They rotate faster around each other. And so the frequency of, the, of this rotation is related to the frequency of the gravitational wave. And uh, um, so we only start getting sensitive to the wave as it enters our sensitive band. So uh, once the frequency gets to be above uh, uh, 10, 20 hertz, then we start seeing the signal. Uh, the, the, the wave was there before, but a much lower frequency. Um, and, and the peak, the, the, what you hear is that chirp, that, and so close that they merge. 
And now, depending on how big those objects are, uh, they can get closer. So the black holes um, get, don't get as close as the neutron stars do. Uh, for the neutron star, they get closer, and so we get more frequency, more cycles, and uh, it goes to higher frequency. And so, in fact, from that is how we, we, uh, we can infer what were the masses of the uh, neutron stars or the black holes. It's really about uh, how many cycles do we get in the uh, sensitivity band for our detector, which is between uh, 10, 20 hertz and uh, a kilohertz, roughly, uh, which is the audio band. That's why we can uh, listen to it. So with the GRBs, why, why exactly are the gamma rays only directed in one direction rather than in all directions? So you have material that is doing like this, and all is, and everything is in falling into this just born black hole. And, uh, and, and, and as it is in falling, most of the material will actually get sucked into the black hole. But the stuff that is along the axis of rotation may be able to spiral out, and there's a little bit jet where things can escape. And then it's only that material that escapes in jets that is going to be producing radiation. And uh, so you're looking down that jet, and then it's that you found the gamma rays. Yeah, if, if I may add to that, um, so jet physics is very, very complicated. Because here you deal with uh, general relativity, deal with uh, strong magnetic fields, hydrodynamics, plasma physics. It's, it's a very messy, messy region. And I, I think we only start now, we are only at the beginning starting to understand how, how jet forms, how jet formation actually takes place. Uh, jets are very common phenomena in the universe. You can find them in supermassive black holes. Sometimes they also have a torus. It's just that it goes really, really slow. Supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. They also have a torus, and some of them also have these jets coming out. Those things have been imaged, and they're, you, know, you can look M87 by the Hubble telescope, and you see this beautiful image in invisible light of the, of the jet of M87. Um, but they have also been imaged in radio for supermassive black holes and things like that. For smaller objects, though we believe they exist, they, they have not been imaged directly. We have to infer that they are there. They're just too tiny for us to be able to take a picture of them. Um, hi. So you mentioned that the neutral, uh, the neutral stars, that they get closer together and that affects the frequency of the gravitational waves. Do they oscillate? Do they get closer together and then farther apart? Or do they get closer together and then reach some ultimate point? Um, so, so what we expect is, you know, overall that they get closer together. Uh, because what happens is that they uh, lose, uh, the system loses energy. Uh, that energy is taken away by the waves. And so as they lose energy, they get approach. They in spiral into each other. So really, it's the in spiral is the process that, that we get. Now, uh, there can be modulation, though, to the, to the signal, so which is not the same as getting closer and farther away, but the amplitude can be modulated. And that's if, there is, uh, um, if, if the objects are spinning. So, so then you, have, uh, uh, you have two frequencies at play. There is the frequency of the spinning and the frequency of the spiraling. And that can produce this kind of beat uh, formation in the, in the wave. And so um, that's also how, by really looking very carefully at that waveform, uh, we, can, uh, we can infer whether uh, the objects are spinning or not. Um, so we're looking, I, I, those of you who are a physics major, you may be familiar with the spin orbit effects in quantum mechanics. Uh, we have something similar here. So we have the spinning of the objects around their own axis, and the spins can be aligned or not with the angular momentum of, of the two that are in spiraling. And so there are spin orbit effects that we can go after as well and constrain. Right, so, so this, this object I've been spinning for, you know, just, just in spiraling for uh, a long time, right? It could be a million of years. But uh, as far as we are concerned, we, we see for the, when it's a black hole, so speak black holes that we saw, we started seeing two years ago, we have seen quite a few of them by now. Uh, for those, we just see the last uh, fraction of a second. So uh, the signals that you heard before, the chirping, that's how long the signal is in our detector. 0.2 seconds, 0.3 seconds um, before, they before they merge. 
For the binary neutron star, because they can get closer, we go to higher frequency, so we can hear a minute-long signal. So I, you, you are here waiting for a while, you could see the trace appearing, and that was the last 20 seconds. Uh, but actually, we're sensitive. We could actually go to 90 seconds for this one. Um, for the short gamma ray bursts, um, you were saying that sometimes you see them like head on. So when does that mean that it's coming straight towards the Earth? And if it is, is there any like negative effects that has on like the planet itself? Um, so the ones that are detected by satellites, the vast majority of them probably were looking right down the barrel. Um, these specific gamma ray bursts associated with the gravitational waves was seen a little bit of axis. And the fact that we could see it with gamma rays is because it was a particularly close one. So compared to others that are typically seen by satellites, this was in gamma rays relatively weak. Um, so if you ignore the gravitational waves, you only think about the ones that we see with satellites, yes, you're almost always looking down the, down the jet. Um, as to whether that poses any danger, um, these things are extremely far away, and we say they're extremely bright, but that's because we managed to detect them here. In terms of damage to the planet, there's, there's nothing significant. If you were to have a gamma ray burst and the jet pointing at us within our own galaxy, that would be another story. <clears throat> um, the gamma ray bursts are exceedingly rare on galaxies. Exceedingly rare. That's not a common event at all. Um, I mean, LIGO will see eventually a couple hundred megaparsecs, I think. And, and uh, you know, we will see every single one of them. And it will not be all going off in all the galaxies all the time. It will be an extremely, extremely rare um, event. I think the estimate for our own galaxy for the last gamma ray burst, pointing in any possible direction, uh, was on this, is on the scale of, you know, I think a couple hundred million years. So, yeah. I say the radiation you get on an airplane is more dangerous, right? Yeah. Ignacio, I have a question for you, actually. <clears throat> Sorry. Yes, uh, you indicated that we would only see the gamma ray burst if it were aimed at us, and so therefore there are many, many other directions that those gamma ray bursts could be aimed. You indicated, I think, that we see one per day. If that's the case, then how many are there that go off each day? Well, that, that the, as, I, as, as I mentioned before, if we think that the jet opening is five degrees, then you know you have an idea of what is the correction factor that you have to get, you know, from one per day to how many per day in the entire universe without the without the jet effect. And I'm not going to be able to do that in my head now. Uh, so it's basically a, a five degree area on the, uh, the sphere of the. Uh, Universe and so okay, let me. I can do that in my head. I think I can is. do that in my head. So let's say that is 25 square degrees, five degrees by five degrees. Okay, and the entire sky is 40,000 square degrees. So the ratio of that, and you get two jets, so it's actually 50 square degrees. So you know the ratio of 50 to 40,000. It's it's you know how much you have to multiply by one per day to get the so rate in the about universe. About Yep. Per day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's a pretty messy business out there. So I think I was going to ask the exact same question from a different angle, which was that, that uh, it, we were, it seems like if you assume that the orientation of the jets is, is uh, even with respect to Earth, I mean, they're in all different directions. We, we were very lucky that the first binary neutron star that LIGO saw had the jet aimed close enough in our direction that we got a GRB. Um, how, how likely or unlikely was that? I was thinking, is it more like one in a hundred, one in a thousand? It sounds like it's something more like one in a thousand. We would expect one in a thousand binary neutron star mergers roughly to have a jet pointed at us. Is that, do I have that right? I, 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 don't think, I don't think it was that lucky because he was not really dead on pointing at us. This gravitational wave, this specific one, the neutron star, neutron star system was very close to Earth. This is by far the closest short gamma ray burst we have ever observed. And the fact that we managed to see it with, with uh, gamma rays is because it was 
a bit of access, not a lot, a bit of access, but it is so close that we can steal some of the gamma rays. If you want to see the very distant ones, which are the typical ones that we see with satellites, that's when you have to see them head on. Okay, so if they're very close, it's not actually that hard to see them with gamma rays anyway. Well, one, one question I have for you, Ignacio, maybe you remember that. Uh, did Fermi trigger on this gamma ray burst on its own, or did they have to look in the data and look back um, and, and, and search for, for the signal? These, these gamma rays, so let me go back to that slide that I had shown. I had shown the information from LIGO, and it had the chirp, the whoop, and it also had the beep from gamma rays, and one happened one and a half seconds after the other. As I said, Fermi is looking at two-thirds of the sky all the time on its own, and it found the GRB on its own. Nobody had to tell it to go look at it. It was at the same time, LIGO said, oh, we found something. And at the same time, Fermi, because they have the automated system that said, oh, we, all, we have a GRB. And you probably know the story better of how they were mixed. Yeah, so, so the Fermi trigger, um, so they, they, they have a much more automatized system than we do. We're kind of newbies at sending out triggers fast. Um, so, so that trigger came first, but it was actually not a particularly interesting trigger. So it's not the kind of GRBs that people would have dropped everything to go after. Uh, what we saw was in our on online analysis, we saw uh, the Banner Neutron Star, and we had just received the automatic circular that said there was a GRB within, uh, within uh, two, less than two seconds, second and a half. And so it was just bringing the two together. We immediately alerted uh, everybody else, but it still took about 40 minutes. So there are 40 minutes of things we don't know. Actually, there are 10 hours of the story that we don't know. So we could piece together that nice movie that we saw. That's by piecing together the old story all the way out to the uh, what's called the Kilo Nova, so the, the, the alchemy that took place afterwards. But we still don't know what happened in those first 10 hours. And so the challenge is going to be to shrink in things. Um, and we have all sorts of agreements and things going on with the GRB uh, detectors. Um, now, Integral is another satellite. Uh, they are not trigger on that specifically. They went back and reanalyzed it. They, they went back in the archive data and found a weaker signal. Because again, they were looking even farther under the, the flash I've been. So. I was just always wondering whether the gravitational waves are the directionals, directional or not. Um, what are they shape when they start expanding? The shape of the bubble of the gravitational wave? Um, so, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's, um, um, it's, it's not, so it's not spherical. It's, uh, there is some, it's, again, I'm picturing more like a peanut type shape, right? Uh, yes. Which is actually the antenna pattern as well, but never mind. Uh, there is some form of beaming, uh, but it really goes with the, and that's because uh, the gravitational wave is proportional to the quadruple moments of, of the source itself. So it's really, there is a, a, some preferred direction, which is um, perpendicular uh, as well to the plane of the, of the, uh, of the orbit, but it's not, it's not jets. Um, right, right. Because right. it affects the time itself too. It affects the space time, right? Right, that's right, yeah. Actually, Pablo is probably more expert in this since he actually simulates the stuff, so he's actually more appropriate to answer that question. <laughs> So maybe I'm missing something here, but the gravitational waves are covering a greater volume of space that we can detect than the gamma ray bursts. The gamma ray bursts, we think there are probably maybe 8,000 a day because we're only detecting the on-axis ones. Why aren't we detecting more out of LIGO? Because, uh, um, because some of these things are too far away for LIGO to see. Right, so this one is uh, 40 megaparsec, it's 135 million light years away. Most of this uh, um, thousand signal per day, so the one per day that are detected, are, are coming from billion years away. Um, and so, so they're much farther away. And, and the thing is that uh, it's, uh, the gravitational wave is such a small effect uh, that, that we are not only sensitive to our nearby region of the universe. And so this, the fortuitous thing is that one of these things happened so close that we could see uh, the Bani Neutron Star. Um, 
Now we need to improve our sensitivity to look even farther out. And so we expect there are a bunch more farther out, uh, but we, we need, we're getting there. So, so this is the first time we got close and we got one this close. And that, that was fortuitous because there aren't that many gamma rays either. They are so close. Um, so. Thanks. All right, we have time for one more question. Why is the expansion of the universe accelerating? I'll give that to the chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not connected with gravitational waves. It's more what we don't know. It's called dark energy. And uh, it, could be, it could be a particle that acts as it's called a cosmological constant, but definitely not uh, gravitational waves. We don't know. All right, let's uh, thank our panelists, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>